Hi, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our last instalment of the um, Library's Tasmania contribution to National Family History Month. Welcome to everyone in the room and uh, to whoever is listening in on the webinar today. Um, today, we are very proud to have one of our very regular presenters over our National Family History Month programs, um, Brian Reset, presenting um, administration of justice. He's going to take us through some of the people who gave out some of the penalties for crimes and punishments that none of us want to probably have endured in our lifetime. So he, he's proposed that it will be quite a grim talk for some, but it'll be tantalising, I'm sure. Before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge Tasmania's Aboriginal people. Um, we acknowledge the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutruwita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people whose countries were never ceded. So please welcome Brian Sint to talk to us today. Oh, and for anyone, anyone who's there in the room, please turn your phones to silent if you can. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and, and uh, thank you, Jasmine, for that introduction. Uh, I have done the odd talk here before. Um, today's hopefully not going to be too odd. And uh, But let's begin. Browsing in the library on the level below us here, you'll find several rows of shelves simply marked crime. Fact or fiction, fiction, we can't help ourselves being fascinated reading the stories of lawbreakers and those who seek to bring them to justice. This is no new phenomenon, as tales of criminal activities have enthralled our ancestors for centuries. The more shocking, the better. So my talk today should give you an insight into the intriguing history of those men, and only men, who carried out the punishment of capital crime in our state. This heading, Administration of Justice, was a term coined by the Audit Department of the Tasmanian Government in the late 19th century to disguise payments being made to the executioner Yet it was appropriate term, as the executioner certainly was the final administration, administrator of justice. And he handed out this ultimate punishment of the law. And so the talk, of course, I have to say, does contain some grim details. I tried to, to not make it too grim, but um, I'm in, examining the lives of the persons who were involved with or carried out these sentences. With the arrival in Van Diemen's land of John Bowen to form the settlement at Risdon Cove in 1803, he also brought British law to govern, as well as a long established, established legal system, together with its age-old tradition of punishment for all offenders. Most of these laws still in, exist in Australia today, with the exception of the ultimate punishment of death, last carried out 56 years ago in Melbourne. However, as you might might not be able to read all the bottom of it. It's, it does tell you that uh, in Van Diemen's Land and Tasmania, some 550 men and four women were sentenced to be hanged by the neck until they were dead. They were executed over a period of 140 years of our history. Public hangings always drew vast crowds of witnesses. And with the hangman often becoming the centre of attention as he carried out his gruesome duties. Our longest serving executioner became virtually a legendary figure whilst trying to live out a respectable family life. There's a little bit about family history. And finally, in the 20th century, men from the mainland were paid to come to Hobart to carry out their repugnant gallows duties. On the 18th of January, 1806, just after 12 months of arriving with Lieutenant Colonel William Patterson at Port Dalrymple, three soldiers, aided by the cooper of the stores, broke into the cast of provisions, stealing 35 pounds or 16 kilograms of pork. They were quickly arrested. They were returned to Sydney to face the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction, where they were found guilty of putting the infant settlement dependent on public stores in distress for their own individual gratification. 
Sentenced to death, two men were returned to Van Diemen's Land on the schooner Estramina, while the other two received a royal pardon for some reason. Now, Thomas England and James Keating arrived at Port Dalrymple on the 31st of March. The following morning, England was taken ashore to Yorktown and hanged by the neck by members of his own New South Wales Corps. He was the first person executed in Van Diemen's Land. Meanwhile, James Keating managed to escape from the Estramina, but was located after three days and returned to the schooner, which arrived in Hobart Town a week later. On the 14th of April, Keating, attended by the Reverend Robert Knopwood, was taken beneath a tree near Cascades Creek, which is now Hobart Rivulet, of course, where facing the assemblage of Lieutenant Governor David Collins, along with the detachment of Royal Marines and all available convict prisoners, he was duly hanged by the neck by military officers. Nearly four years then passed when two convicts were sent to Sydney for trial before the judge advocate who sentenced both them in to be executed. On their arrival back in Hobart Town, they were taken down to Garth's farm in Sandy Bay, not sure just where Garth's farm is, but somewhere in Sandy Bay, where the military officers acted as executioners and they carried out their sentence. Now, one man was executed in 1811, but no records exist as to who he was, what was his crime, or where he was hung. We have to move on another four years. Bushranger Michael Howe and his deputy, James Whitehead, and their gang were attacking settlers at New Norfolk on the conflict. And in the conflict, Whitehead was shot dead by the uh, someone there that, that, uh, who was attacking. The authorities... The authorities returned to Hobart Town with his headless body. The head was found a couple of years later, strange to say, which was hung in chains a few days later on Hunter's Island, Hunter's Island that body, that is not the head. Rather than being sent to Sydney for trial, Thomas Stevens, arrested after stealing duty, was tried before a, ma a bench of magistrates in Hobart Town. He was sentenced to death and executed 25th of May, also on Hunter's Island, and his body was hung in chains beside Whitehead. Exactly one month later, due to the increasing difficulties of relentless bushranging, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Davey declared martial law, ordering that all criminal offences would now be tried under a local court martial held in Hobart Town. Thus, Thomas Morley, who murdered James Connolly at Hollow Tree a fortnight later, was tried under that martial law. He was sentenced to death and also executed on Hunter's Island, and his body, although his body, was removed for dissection by the surgeons and not hung in chains. The following day, 23-year-old bushranger Richard Maguire was also executed on Hunter's Island and his body hung in chains. A fortnight later, another bushranger, Hugh Bourne, who had been wounded and captured, suffered the same fate and also hung in chains. Now, I'm not sure whether you can read that, but basically it says that the four gibbeted bodies remaining hanging on Hunter's Island, they became objects of disgust before being re removed by the Lieutenant Governor 12 months later. That was early Hobart town for him. Now, these previous 10 executions were carried out in the early days of the settlement by military officers who either volunteered or were ordered to perform their gruesome tasks. We have no record of the names of those individual officers. But around sometime around mid-1817, the government appointed their first executioner. His name was John Jones. He was a convict from New South Wales. He'd been to sent to Hobart Town with a six-year sentence in 1814. Three men were executed on June 1817, but no records of their details apart from their names exist. I'm not going to mention a lot of names today, but some. On the 28th of January 1818, murder Richard Collier was taken on a cart up Elizabeth Street to the rise of the hill at the start of the Newtown Road. Collywood had been found guilty and sentenced to death in the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction back in Sydney. Under a tree, executioner John Jones placed the root noose attached to a branch around Collier's neck and drove the cart away to accomplish his duty. Herbert Jones, the executioner, was well known and liked around Hobart Town from carrying out other menial tasks and all sorts of employment. But he was addicted to drinking spirits, lucky him. On the 28th of May, 1818, he was quite intoxicated and he lay down on a floor in Elizabeth Street, somewhere in Elizabeth Street, to have a bit of a snooze. But, like Hobart, rain began to fall quite heavily and two hours later, when they tried to rouse him, Jones was found to be lifeless. 
The coroner's inquest returned a verdict that Jones had died by a visitation of God. Robert Knopwood buried Jones in St David's burial ground. With the unfortunate departure of Jones, a replacement executor was found in the person of James Charlton. Charleston, it's sometimes spelt with the Charlton and sometimes with Charles Ton. However, little of his life in early Van Diemen's land is known. He arrived as a convict from New South Wales as early as 1810, we believe, and he received a conditional pardon in 1816. He was appointed as executioner to replace Jones, and he was paid the annual salary of £25. He executed his first clients near Battery Point in June 1818. Both men had just returned from Sydney under the sentence of death, of course, for murder and sheep stealing. Charleston then had a break, but he was paid for two years until July 1820 when he executed his next two men, who both been sentenced to death in Sydney. But events in Van Diemen's Land were soon to dramatically change with the arrival in Hobart Town on the 16th of January 1821 of Judge Advocate John Wilde. He held Supreme Court trials in the courtroom of the Colonial Hospital, of all places. In all, 13 men were sentenced to death for various crimes by Judge Wilde. The first three were executed by Charleston in April, uh, still at Battery Point. However, it was decided that with a large number of men facing death, a more permanent place of execution was needed. Thus, a new platform was constructed well out of town on the upper end of Macquarie Street, on the road to Cascade as they called it then. The mechanism did not contain a lever-operated trapdoor, as later used, but 10 men were all hung together on the 28th of April, 1821. Judge Advocate Wilde then travelled to Launceston to hold criminal trials there, eventually sentencing seven men to death. Charleston, of course, was sent up to Launceston to execute three of them in Launceston and the remaining four further up the river at Georgetown. So 24 men Charleston did. No record has been heard about Charleston after October 1821. He just disappeared, not recorded as being dead or anything else like that. We just don't know. So another executioner was then appointed, and the government certainly found their man. He had did this rather grim task over the next 16 years. John Doherty, his name, he was a 26-year-old pop-pitted 85th Regiment soldier with a cast in his left eye. He was court-martialed in Hyderabad, India and received a sentence of 14 years transportation, arriving in Hobart Town in December 1819. He wasn't appointed executioner for a start, he was appointed chief flagellator, that meant he whipped people. But he had a, a few problems, and he was often found to be himself on the stinging end of the whip for his continuous and serious, serious drinking binges. In 1822, Doherty was then paid the same wage of £25 per annum as executioner. He was accommodated in the Campbell Street House of Correction, which is the main building on the, the right here. But Doherty, he kept on drinking himself into oblivion, and which saw him constantly appearing before the local magistrates, where he was habitually fined five shillings, which was a lot, but he was being paid £25 a, a year, so that was he was able to live by it and not having to pay any rent at the barracks. But he was also sentenced to be incarcerated in Murray Street Jail between one and four weeks at a time, and he received over 200 lashes for his drinking problems. Meanwhile, in 1825, or 24, sorry, it was decided an execution and flagellator, separate from Doherty, was needed in Launceston to save sending Doherty up there, because Doherty had a little habit of disappearing when he was being transported. So they appointed 19-year-old John Thompson, who'd arrived in Hobart 10 in 1823 with a seven-year sentence for housebreaking. Like his southern counterpart, Doherty, Thompson had a drinking problem as well. He received 125 lashes and jail for a variety of offences, including insolence, abuse, disorderly conduct, disobedience of orders, and even housebreaking. Although Thompson only executed 14 men just over three days in September 24, he remained on the books as executioner until 1826. On his return to Hobart Town, he became destitute. He was lodged at the Liverpool Street Watch House. It was there in this building on the 8th of April, 1826, that 34-year-old Margaret Ball was found murdered with multiple stab wounds and a throat cut. 
Thompson was found standing over her, holding a large knife with his hands smeared with blood. He confessed to his crime. Of course, he couldn't do anything else. He was tried, sentenced to death, and he was executed in Hobart by John Doherty, the other executioner. Thus, a replacement executor, executioner was required again for Launceston. This time, London-born, brown-eyed, very bald man, 21-year-old Ralph Jacobs, arrived in Hobart Town in September 1818 with a life sentence. But Jacobs was constantly in trouble for being absent, assault, housebreaking, theft, and he received a total of 275 lashes, along with multiple sentences to work on the road gangs. He then escaped the colony, disappeared from Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land, somehow arriving back in London, only to be arrested and re-transported back to Van Diemen's Land. Strangely, he was appointed executioner in Launceston, housed in the jail, and this duty he only took on three occasions in February 1827 and February 1829, albeit on those three occasions, he executed 24 men. Jacobs was dismissed in 1830 after endeavouring to obtain a certificate of freedom of executioner. He said he was the executioner and he should be free. Instead, he received 50 lashes and was returned to a chain gang for 12 months. Meanwhile, back in Hobart Town, John Dougherty was kept busy with at least one execution each month except October and November. It was also the year that the first woman was executed. 28-year-old Mary McLaughlin arrived in Hobart Town in January 1829 with a 14-year sentence, mainly for housebreaking and theft. She was assigned to a household in Richmond, where in August she was found to be pregnant and returned to the Cascades female factory to await the birth. In early December, Mary delivered a boy child by herself the baby was soon after found dead, unfortunately, in mysterious circumstances. Mary was charged with murdering her son. She had no defence, couldn't explain anything. Thus, she was found guilty and sentenced to death. On the 19th of April, 1830, John Doherty led Mary McLaughlin to the scaffold at Murray Street Jail. Mary was dressed in a long white gown with a black ribbon round her waist. He quickly fixed the noose and placed a white hood over her face. Mary barely had time to utter, oh my God before Doherty launched her into eternity. Now, over the years, Doherty became the target for humour in the local newspapers, who frequently reported his repeated drunkenness. They referred to him as Jack Ketch, who was an infamous 17th century execution, English executioner, whose real name was John Ketch, but he was always called Jack Ketch. Still, term still used today for executioners. Doherty was amusingly also called the senior of his profession, that bird of ill omen, the executioner, the finisher of the law, and the celebrated John Doherty, the framer of the Suspension Act. One newspaper stated that his duties are very trifling, and although occasionally commencing at eight in the morning, yet no single instance has been known of their continuing after half past nine. We know little of the life he led apart from his drinking problems. However, he was our most prolific executioner, had many notable clients, including Macquarie Harbour cannibal escapee Alexander Pierce and bush ranger James McCabe, as well as three Indigenous men. On one occasion, he executed 23 men just in three days. In total, over a short term of 12 years only as executioner, John Doherty had dispatched 239 men, as well as Mary McLaughlin, to eternity. Mostly they were in Hobart Town but three took place on Halliday Island in Macquarie Harbour, and the last four of his 19 occurred in Launceston in mid-November 1837. On his return to Hobart Town, he was be found to be in a declining state of health. He was attended by well-known surgeon, Dr William Crowther, who has been in the news lately. John Doherty was found dead at 6am on the 12th of January 1838 in his Murray Street Jail, sleeping place. After an inquest, he was buried by Reverend Knockwood in St David's burial ground, not far from his remains of the 220 local subjects who were also buried nearby. Thus, the hunt was on again to find a new executioner to find Doherty. The principal superintendent of convicts again had a good man, he thought. 23-year-old Bristol-born labourer William Thompson had received a 14-year sentence for stealing a coat. He arrived in Hobart Town on the transport Persian in 1830. Thompson was employed as a flagellator at Hobart Town for several years 
where his vicious nature became legendary. His criminal tendencies then caused him to spend time in chain gangs at Port Arthur as the flagellator. In 1836, he was charged with culpable negligence for punishment for punishing a young boy at Point Beware with a cat, with not nine, but ten tails. For that despicable offence, Thompson was himself punished with 50 lashes. However, following the death of John Doherty, William Thompson was appointed executioner on the same salary, together with rations and slops clothing. His first execution took place in June 1838, but he was soon back to his criminal practices for which he received regular sentences of hard labour, again sent to Port Arthur. He was released, sent to Launceston for an execution, which he bungled. The man, unfortunately, took several minutes to die. Finally, Thompson was charged with having stolen blankets, clothes and other articles. The offence being proved against him, his existing sentence was extended for two years and he was returned to Port Arthur. That now brings us to the most well-known and best known longest serving executioner in Tasmania's history. His name was Solomon Blay. He was born in Oxford in 1816. His father was a labourer in a market garden, while his mother ran a stall at the local market selling fruit and vegetables. Solomon, as a teenager, worked in the, for the Oxford canal boats before he appeared in the Oxford City Sessions in 1833, charged with stealing two bushels of potatoes. Strangely, he was observed taking these bags of, bush of uh, potatoes to the market for his mother to sell. He was imprisoned in Oxford jail for 12 months. On his release, Solomon managed to keep out of trouble until 1836, when he and two friends were arrested with six counterfeit shillings in their possession, along with the plaster dies and other apparatus to make the coins. It was a serious offence. Aged just over 20, Solomon was sentenced to 14 years transportation. Now, he was six foot eight inches tall, that's 174 centimetres. He was clean shaven with blue eyes, dark brown hair, but his face was deeply pockpitted from smallpox and he had a small lump under his right eye. He arrived in Hobart Town, March 1837, and he was sent to the prisoners' barracks in Campbell Street for assignment. There he emphasised his boating skills from the Oxford boats. He was immediately appropriated to a James Murdoch who was operating the Greenpoint Ferry near present-day Bridgewater before the, the uh, causeway was built, of course. In February 1838, it was recorded in Solomon's favour that he had saved a mailbag which had fallen overboard. The Lieutenant Governor granted him a remission of two years off his sentence. And not long after that, he was appointed as a police constable at Brighton, again on a pricely sum of one shilling and ninepence a day, which was about good money for a, a, a convict at the time. Later, he was transferred to the boat's crew at Southport to guide ships around the this area down there, Southport area, before being promoted as a constable to Launceston. Now, back in civilization may not have been good change for Solomon. He was soon in trouble and placed in solitary confinement for 14 days on bread and water for being drunk and delivering, delivering a woman, also drunk, into the female factory. A second, very similar offence saw Solomon dismissed from the police force and he was sentenced to six months hard labour at the Campbelltown chain gang. Twice caught trying to break out of his leg irons, he received an extra six month sentence of hard labour and he was transferred to the Jerusalem Convict Probation Station, which is present day Colebrook, of course, where he was employed as a washerman in the laundry. Quite a good job, probably, at the time. It was there that he received notification that the governor approved the remission of his chain gang sentence if he agreed to be employed as the executioner, where he would be housed in the relative comfort of the House of Correction of the Campbell Street Prisons Barracks. Now, whether Solomon received any training or instructions on the method of execution is un unknown. And why they chose him is also unknown. There's a, a, a record of the letter that was sent to him, but it doesn't exactly say what was on the, in the letter. Thus it was in late January 1841, just a few days after his 25th birthday, Solomon arrived back in Launceston to prepare for the execution. Two men had been convicted in the Supreme Court of burglary. They were brought to the gallows and apparently dispatched quite efficiently by Solomon. In front of a crowd estimated to be around 500 people, 
including many women, some even with children in their arms. Solomon returned to Hobart Town to await his next job. He was still a convict under sentence, but received, soon received a small allowance. In May, he was called upon to carry out a grim task yet again. It was reported that on the gallows, or beneath the gallows, after placing the ropes round the men's neck and drawing the caps over their faces, Solomon then shook hands with both men before he confined the wretched men to whence no traveller returns. This final, quite genial deed of shaking hands with the men when he was about to dispatch them was Solom something Solomon continued to practice for most of his working life. But his life was about to change. Come on. Thank you. In March 1842, with Hobart Town almost deserted as residents attended a horse race meeting at Newtown, Solomon and a young friend who he'd met in the barracks selected a house in Hill Street, West Hobart. They forced a window. They broke in. They stole two coats to the value of four pounds and a pair of trousers. But as they were leaving the house, they were seen and they were quickly captured and remanded to the next Supreme Court sessions. Found guilty, they were each sentenced to be transported for life. Solomon's friend, the young bloke, he went to Port Arthur. However, in consequence of agreeing to continue to undertake, undertake the duty of executioner, Solomon was sentenced to be kept in Richmond jail with hard labour for four years. While incarcerated in Richmond jail, each time he was required for an execution, Solomon was released several days prior under the watchful eye of a javelin man, where he would then be locked up near the Hobart town, Launceston, or Oakland's jail, where he carried out the execution before being returned by coach back to Richmond jail. In 1845, Solomon then received permission to leave the jail during the day, only having to return at night. He was also allowed the privilege to travel the state by himself when attending to his official duties as executioner. So he was really free. Now we must pause because we are now moving to Norfolk Island. Norfolk Island and its petal settlement had been transferred under the control of Van Diemen's Land back in 1844. They had quite an interesting history there, but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that happened. Now, I have to mention Alfred Jones. He's the one I have to mention. He was a man of colour. He was descended from slaves and he was born in, in uh, 1801 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Louisiana sorry. Somehow he had reached London in England in his late 20s, where he received a seven-year transportation for theft and arrived in Hobart Town in 1830. But Jones became well known about town as the most incorrigible and irreclaimable thief and scoundrel. Unfortunately, being a man of colour, as they would say today, an American, African-American, he was sentenced to Supreme Court for all these crimes. Every time he was did something, he was seen in court and eventually sentenced to life transportation, Norfolk Island. During his voyage to Norfolk Island, a number of convicts on the, on the boat staged a mutiny, a piratical attempt to seize the brig. They were quickly overpowered. However, Jones, who wasn't involved in the mutiny, became the chief prosecution witness to that mutiny. But two days after his arrival in May 1845, the body of a missing constable was found in the gully near what is called Bloody Bridge, still called Bloody Bridge today. And there was a nice little bridge there in Norfolk Island. Two convicts were arrested and charged with the murder. They were found guilty and sentenced to death. But naturally, Solomon Blay couldn't be spared to travel to Norfolk Island. Hence, there was no executioner available on the island. Thus, the authorities searched for someone. Who would do this grim task? The Alfred Jones, who'd been kept under strict protection following the mutiny, was totally inexperienced but he finally agreed to their demands. The scaffold had been erected in front of the old jail, and just after 8am on the 3rd of September 1845, Jones led the men out, placed them under the beam, and launched them into eternity. Later that same day, for his own protection, Jones was taken aboard a ship, leaving for Sydney, where he was transferred back to Van Diemen's Land to serve out his sentence at Port Arthur, eventually receiving his Certificate of Freedom in 1857. But meanwhile, still on Norfolk Island, Two more capital crimes by stabbing were committed in 1845, but there was no, answer, no one there to judge them, so the trials were held over until 1846. Come back to that. 
Now, in September 1845, also brought Solomon Blay a new challenge. In January that year, Jane Saunders, a young servant girl, went missing from the Dewitt Hotel at New Norfolk, at New Norfolk, not Norfolk, at New Norfolk. This is the Dewitt Hotel at New Norfolk, still there today. Jane's body, young Jane Saunders, 18-year-old, was found the next day in the Dewitt River. Three convicts were charged with her murder, found guilty and sentenced to death after months of trials. Now, Eliza Benwell, a 42-year-old convict maid who worked at the hotel at the time, was then put on trial for, for aiding, abetting and assisting the men in Jane's murder. At her trial, after five days, the jury found her not guilty, as they said they didn't believe the men murdered the girl anyway. But Judge Montague, he disagreed with their verdict and he sent the jury back to deliberation twice. Each time they came back and said, no, not guilty. And he said, well, I'm not going home, basically, until you find her guilty. And this is 11 o'clock at night, uh, more. So eventually they found Eliza guilty, no matter what happened to the girl. Judge Montague then sentenced Eliza, unfortunately, to death. And then as soon as Eliza was sentenced to death, the three men were executed a couple of days later. Two weeks later, Eliza was led from a cell by Solomon at Murray Street Jail. That's good. Yes, we do. Sorry. Uh, again, at Murray Street Jail, she was staying there before execution, and a crowd of over a thousand people were waiting below in Murray Street. They went into a quiet hush. Eliza closed her eyes, not wishing to see the spectators below, but some late prayers were said, but Solomon made the final adjustments and then operated the trapdoor lever. To him, it was just the work of a moment. It was his 46th execution and he was still only 29 years old. Mid-1846 saw a new and interesting chapter begin in Solomon's life. Having completed his four-year sentence, he left Richmond Jail and was relocated at Hoatland's Jail, where he lived quite comfortably in one of the condemned cells. He was free to come and go about the town as long as he was back in the jail by 9pm. It also saved a lot of travelling expenses with easy coach journeys for executions in Hobart Town or Launceston. He even received an increase in his salary and he made some pocket money on the side, being paid two pounds a time to clean out the foul-smelling cesspit in the, inside the jail walls. But back on Norfolk Island, a large bloody insurrection called the Cooking Pot Riot took place on the 1st of July, 1846. The Commandant had withdrawn privileges the convicts had private cooking saucepans and kettles to do their own cooking when they, if they didn't like the, the food that they were given by the authorities. But the commandant said, no, you're going to lose all of that. So he had the men go around, the guards go around and collect all these saucepans and kettles. The prisoners were outraged, of course, and they formed gangs to regain their tent utensils from the storeroom. So... It was called the, uh, as you said, the, uh, the cooking pot riot, of course. Okay, now former bush ranger William Westwood, who was also known as Jackie Jackie, was there. And he rushed with a large group of men, armed with axes, into the lumber yard where Westwood killed the guard with a blow to his head. Westwood then shouted, come follow me and you will follow me to the gallows. And about 60 men followed him, but many prisoners, of course, remained in the yard. After three men were murdered by the mob, order was restored by the military men and the ringleaders arrested. Fourteen men were put on trial in the schoolroom of the prisoners' barracks. They were charged with murder and aiding and abetting murder. All pleaded not guilty. Now two were found not guilty, with the remaining 12 sentenced to death. The next month, a sub-overseer was murdered by two convicts. Those men were tried as well, found guilty and also sentenced to die, but to be kept apart from the rioters. Who was going to do this execution there? Well, convicts James White and Thomas Hamilton were appointed executioners. White had been transported under a life sentence to Norfolk Island for attempted murder in Hobart in 1844. He was an ex-soldier, had been recorded as troublesome, treacherous, whereas Hamilton had been transported directly to, New York, to, Norfolk, to Norfolk Island. Sorry, I'm getting... Confused. Under a 14-year sentence for setting fire to a stockyard in England. 
These multiple executions were carried out in the morning of 13th of October 1846 in two batches of six on new gallows that consisted of two beams and trapdoors which were erected in front of the new jail. After each set of executions, the bodies were removed to unconsecrated ground outside the cemetery when still known there as Murderer's Mound. Six days later, White and Hamilton executed a 13th man for murdering one of the other conflict constables during the riot. Then a fortnight after that, two men had murdered the overseer were also executed. Finally, in early December, the two convicts had been held in close con confinement for 12 months, having been found guilty on the stabbing charges, were brought out and also executed. White and Hamilton were then repatriated back to Van Diemen's Land. They did have an interesting life when they got back here, but we're not going to go into that today. Now, a year, two years later, on, also in Norfolk Island, a flagellator was murdered by a convict armed with an axe. The murder was tried, sentenced to death, and executed in August by a 33-year-old William Croft, who was the other flagellator on the island, with a life sentence. Croft was also repatriated in December, straight afterwards, for his own protection. We must have gone. Missed one there. Okay. Back in Van Diemen's Land, though, now, Solon Blay had been regularly occupied playing his trade. The Government Gazette of 6th of July 1850 announced that Solomon had been granted a pardon available everywhere except in the United Kingdom and the island of Van Diemen's Land. Pardon except where you live. Unfortunately, he'd been received his life sentence here in Van Diemen's Land, so his pardon was invalid and left, unless he left the island. But as far as Solomon was concerned, he had a pardon. He was free. He would still work for the Sheriff's Department as executioner, and he could come and go as he liked. All he wanted was more money, with Sheriff Burnett eventually agreeing to granting him £52 a year, so double what the earlier executioners had got, stating that Solomon had conducted himself with propriety. It was unlikely that any other man would accept the job of executioner. Late 1852 saw Solomon face another difficult task. 17-year-old Mary Sullivan from County Cork had arrived in Hobart Town on a seven-year sentence for stealing quilts. Listed as a nurse girl, she was assigned to care for two young children of the landlord of the old Commodore Hotel in Brisbane Street, now the Brisbane Hotel, of course. One morning in July, Mary was nowhere to be found, and two-year-old baby of the owner, the landlord, Adeline, was also missing from a cradle. They thought Mary might have taken the baby away, but tragically, Adeline's baby was discovered later in a water tank in the backyard. Mary Sullivan was apprehended, charged with Adeline's murder. She was found guilty and sentenced to death. On a scaffold outside Murray Street Jail, Solomon towered over Mary, who only stood four foot seven inches tall. As he adjusted the rope to place the wooden cap over her head, someone in the crowd below called out, but she's only a little girl. But Solomon quickly released the bolt and Mary died without a struggle. Now, an important person was about to enter Solomon's life for another new era was about to begin. Her name was Mary Murphy. This is Mary's convict record. Mary was a housemaid from County Cork. She'd been arrested for setting fire to a house with three friends solely for the purpose of being transported, where they hoped they could find a husband for each of them, which did happen. Since the seven years transportation, she received her wish arriving in, in July 1849. Mary stood just five foot one inch tall. She wasn't that tall. She had dark brown hair, first complexion, wide mouth, a long nose, hazel eyes, but with an unfortunate and very noticeable squint, which didn't seem to worry her or anyone else. After serving her probation, Mary was quite well behaved. She moved to Ross and worked for several local residents. She was granted a ticket of leave. And just how she and Solomon met, we're not quite sure, but they developed a relationship. In the end, they... Solomon asked Mary to marry him, and she agreed, of course. The application to Mary was recommended um, to the government and agreed to by the government in January 1853. Their wedding in St Peter's Church, Oatlands, just over three weeks later, had to be delayed until Solomon returned from Hobart, where he had executed two men. The executioner's work couldn't be deferred, not even for his own wedding. Solomon and Mary then settled down to family life in Oatlands, living in a small property just on the banks of 
Lake Dalberton. Buildings still there. Later they moved to other small rental properties, but they remained childless, unfortunately, through their long marriage. In 1855, an act was introduced stating that the execution of criminals should henceforth be carried into effect privately within the walls of the prison. Mary Street Jail, nice sketch. The gallows were removed from above the wall to an inside yard until 1857, when the prisoners' barracks in Campbell Street became the Hobart Jail. The Murray Street Jail was demolished and the buildings there today were erected. Uh, the scaffold was then erected in the small yard at the rear of Campbell Street Jail. At Patterson Street Jail in Launceston, a portable gallows was built, which could be positioned and moved about inside the walls when necessary. At Oatlands Jail, a similar sized scaffold to Hobart's was also built within the inner wall. In the mid 1860s, Solomon were placed on an annual public service pension of £28, in addition to his normal wage, making his annual salary substantial £70, which is a lot of money. He had set himself up as a second hand dealer, he travelled the state, he used to catch rabbits and sell them, he sharpened knives, he bought and sold whatever he could. As a result, he and Mary were quite well, financially well set up. Interesting enough, Solomon didn't do any of the banking. Mary did all the banking uh, at the, uh, the State Savings Bank, and they, they did have an amazing amount of money saved away. I think she kept it from Solomon, otherwise he would have spent it at the local pub, but that's another story. However, the number of executions were also diminishing. But in 1862, Solomon was faced with executing another woman. Milkman John, oops, well, sorry, thank you. Milkman John Coglin and his wife Margaret lived in this small house in Harrington Street, had the dairy at the back. Um, but Margaret had suffered years of physical abuse from her drunken husband, John. Finally, one night, when he was attempting to bash her with an iron bar, she grabbed the bar and severely hit, hit him. John was later found deceased with multiple wounds. Margaret was put on trial, of course, and she confessed during the trial that she could see that John was dying so hard. She felt sorry for him, so she got his razor and cut his throat. Margaret was found guilty, of course, sentenced to hang. Self-defence for a woman was no defence at all. On 18th of February, 1862, Solomon attended Margaret in the condemned cell at Campbell Street Jail. A few minutes before eight o'clock, he bandaged her eyes that she could see nothing that was about to happen. As the clock struck, Solomon then carefully led Margaret from the cell. Over through the, uh, oh, we point there? That won't work on this. So the, 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 uh, the door on the left there, that's the door to the gallows. So Solomon led Margaret across through that door under the scaffold beams. As Margaret, standing there, uttered the words, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, Solomon quickly operated the trap door and the drop fell, and Margaret passed into the presence of the Eternal. Six years later, in 1868, Solomon, now aged 52, decided he'd done enough of the government's dirty work. 194 executions, that was it. It'd become just too much for him. He submitted his retirement request, which was accepted. Quickly, he and Mary packed up their meagre belongings. They went to the bank, withdrew all their savings, which was about 160 pounds in those days, which was an amazing amount of money. They caught steamer to Melbourne and then another steamer to London, where they bought a small cottage just outside London, where they believed that they could require, retire quietly and unknown to anyone. Unfortunately, a lot of people had come back from Van Diemen's land and Solomon was soon recognised as that executioner. And there was no more peace for them. So they were obliged to sell up their house at a loss and return to Tasmania, where they wouldn't be molested. On his arrival home, Solomon applied for reappointment as executioner, which was granted, and there had been no executioners in the nearly 18 months he'd been away. Blaze set in various cottages in North Hobart before renting this shop front there in Argyle Street, directly diagonally opposite the um, fire station. Solomon there could run from his uh, shop front, his second-hand business, as well as being close to the jail, and he had to come around the corner and uh, to do his, his work there in the jail. Mary appears to have been a quiet, sheltered, 
dutiful, loving and devoted wife. We know very little about Mary's life. Unfortunately, though, in 1884, a bronchitis epidemic raged throughout Hobart. Mary, who was just aged 54, contracted the disease and quietly passed away. Solon arranged her funeral, inviting Mary, many of Mary's friends to attend her graveside service. Some five carts of people came to her service at the graveside. Mary was buried in the Roman Catholic section of Cornelian Bay, which now bears a small monument. Solomon stayed on by himself in Argyle Street, and he carrying out two more executions before early 1891, when he decided to call it a day and tendered his resignation, which was accepted. The news was soon out, and the Mercury displayed a sign under the heading, Wanted a Hangman. Application for Solomon's job floated in. Several were recommended, but the name of one, James Hall, was put aside for future reference. Around the same time, Mrs Ogilvy, the wife of the Richmond magistrate, was brutally murdered. Now, a young man, Arthur Cooley, who had a bad record of indecent assault on women, was taken into custody and eventually charged with Mrs Ogilvy's death. Found guilty, he was sentenced to death, of course. Solomon appeared at approached the sheriff and withdrew his resignation, thinking he might be needed. He appeared at these jail gates here at Campbell Street two days before the execution in a drunken state. Once he was let inside, he became enraged as a jail superintendent. wanted to lock him in a cell because he was drunk. Solomon said that I'm not going to do the execution, and he left the jail, staggered back to his house. But he was back the next day, still drunk. The sheriff, in the meantime, though, having been made aware of Solomon's approaches and his problems with drink, also had appointed James Hall as Solomon's successor. However, Solomon was required and certainly instructed James Hall in preparing Cooley and, uh, and Arthur Cooley for, this, for the gallows. On the Monday morning, Solomon rep remained behind in the condemned cell as Hall led Cooley, who had a bunch of violets in his hand, to the scaffold but Hall had disguised himself from the watchful eyes of the eager newspaper men who wanted to find out who he was. He had a long coat and a hat on. He wore a false beard. He had coloured the visible parts of his face with burnt cork. He had spectacles, and that completed his masquerade. Once he'd adjusted the rope, there was seen to be a painful pause before he decided to pull the lever, but Arthur Cooley's death was instantaneous. Outside the, the pressman, of course, tried to find out who was this new executioner, but the jail officials refused to disclose his name. Hall was never called on to execute anyone else. He was retained until 1895 when his salary was reduced and finally the position of executioner in Tasmania was abolished. The only thing they did at the time, uh, James did at the time, was uh, there was a new law came in that if some young man committed a serious sexual offence against a young girl, he got whipped with a, or lashed with a, a wooden um, cane. And that uh, something was only done for a short while in the 1890s. OK. With Cooley's execution over, Solomon Blay was duly, no duly notified that he was officially dismissed as executioner and was therefore unable to draw his pension or be paid. He was now in his mid-70s, no income. Unfortunately, most of his money had gone. He did have a pet um, magpie, though, strange to say, which he'd trained. But his residential estate was given as a pauper living in Campbell Street. And it's possible that he was being cared for by the Salvation Army in their Salvation Army barracks, which is just opposite the Campbell Street jail. So Solomon had been Tasmania's executioner for 50 long years. 204 people, including Arthur Cooley, had gone to meet their maker, dispatched by his expertise. On the 12th of August 1897, Solomon was admitted to the Royal Hobart Hospital. He was listed as a pensioner, and he died six days later from morbus quartus, heart disease, no doubt caused by his advanced age of 81 years. The newspapers wrote it up quite a lot, but they said he didn't die of that. He died of drop, dropsy, typical newspaper, unfortunate um, humour. Yes, sorry. Um, but former section at Cornelian Bay, Solomon was buried uh, by the state in an unmarked pauper's grave here at Cornelian Bay. Um, it's um, 
just in front of this section here, we, we do know where it, where he's actually buried. In those days, pauper section, so many people in the 1890s were dying uh, from the pauper's um, uh, place where the pauper's were all kept, um, that um, they used to get dig the, the graves 18 foot deep and bury, Solomon's buried with 11 other people in one grave. Amazing. Okay. It's just nothing to do with this. Now, there are no known sketches or photographs of any of Van Diemen's Land or Tasmanian executioners. Oh. Um, even though several of them were still living in the early days of, of portrait photography. Certainly Solomon strictly refused to allow his photograph to be taken, as it took several minutes to accomplish taking photographs in those days, and you had to stand absolutely still. It was not possible to snap a quick picture of him. However, there was an ex-convict from Van Diemen's Land who became an executioner, not here, but in Victoria. I just want to mention him quickly. His name was Eliza Upjohn, who arrived in Hobart Town in 1839 on the transport markers of Hastings on a seven-year sentence. He received his free certificate in 1845, uh, had a, another two-year term back in jail, but he departed for Victoria, where he married and lived in Ballarat for many years before being arrested many, many years later, in 1880, for being a rogue and a vagabond. Locked up in Melbourne jail, he was appointed as flagellator, and he gained notor notoriety, I have trouble with it, but notoriety, by executing Ned Kelly on 11th of November, 1880. Upjohn carried out four more executions there in Melbourne jail before he was dis discharged in 1984, and he was found dead in New South Wales in 1885. Now, here in Tasmania from 1891, there was interim 23 years before the Hobart execution in 1914 of Joseph Henry Belbin, who shot a dead, a young girl at Deloraine, who resisted him as he tried to rape her. It was then another eight years until 18, until 19, sorry, until 1922 when George Carpenter was executed for murdering three men near Swansea. Those executions were performed by the Sydney executioner Thomas Jarvis, who travelled down to Hobart each time under the pseudonym of William. Wilson. Finally, the last person to be executed in Tasmania was Frederick Henry Thompson. He was found guilty of murdering a very young girl. He was hanged on the 14th of February 1946 by two executioners from Melbourne who called themselves Mr Smith and Mr Jones, what their real name was, we have no idea. So here today we've had a brief insight into the lives of some remarkable men who left no diaries, writings or correspondence of how they felt, how it affected them, their friends, and the people with whom they associated regarding their extraordinary and sometimes forceful occupation of being executioner. The hangman officially killed both men and women under direct orders of a court in the administration of justice. Thank you. Does anyone want to ask any question? No. I have a question. Um, just I can't quite go back to the dates of the figures, but it appears that um, in, into the 20th century there were very few, and that big gap of when people were executed. Was that a reduction in the crime rate, right? or they just were not, um, they, were, they weren't being sentenced to? Um, it's hard to say. There were quite a few people, were uh, men especially, were um, um, sentenced to death for murder, but they were always reprieved or, or, uh, and. Um, uh, why the three in, in um, like 1914 um, and so on were, um, were were not reprieved? It's it's really difficult to find out. It was just probably political at the time. Certainly in, in 1946, it was very political um, because uh, Thompson had um, been accused of murdering a little girl, um, and uh, there was an election coming up. Uh, the Labor government who were against capital punishment, um, but generally, you know, there was this. Um, people were saying, well, if you don't execute him, um, he won't get re-elected. So, unfortunately. And um, Fred was, um, or oh, how can I put it? He was um, me mentally challenged, to we put it that way. Um, and he had um, he had a few, um, um, he'd been charged a couple of times with, um, uh, like, indecent exposure and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, uh, he was put, the defence put him on in the box at his trial, and the prosecution said, well, weren't you charged with uh, in, indecent assault and assaulting people and things like that? And poor Fred just said, oh, yeah, but, shoom, guilty. 
Uh, and they, they they tried to appeal that, but it was too late. They, it, yeah, the, the jury had already heard him say that and said, no, he did it. Um, but yes, there was certainly another man involved with, with the murder. Um, he was, the police wouldn't put him on trial as because they said he was a, a um, what do you call it, a, um, a, a witness, a, a troublesome witness or whatever, whatever. Um, but he certainly was involved in it. Who knows, could have also, or could have done the murder instead of Fred, we don't know. In 1855. Yes. It was brought into other colonies around the same time and into Britain. So yeah, it's all, all around the same. It's all around the same time. I think um, I haven't got the exact dates for the for the others, but certainly I think England might have been a, a year later or something like that. But it was all they were all it was around about the same time that that was decided that execution should be should be private because they you know times some of the and I sort of didn't want to go into I mentioned a couple there too, but there were times when they they estimated that you know. Over two thousand people in the street watching, um, so it was not not good at all. So, yeah. Hmm. Right. Make this presentation, you know, like a great story. But of course, you've gone through so many record sets outside of the names and decks. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us what kind of did you go to lower court records and Supreme Court, but what else? What other kinds of records? Would you have looked at to get some of your information for this presentation or this research? Well, <laughs> you imagine. But this is this a well. That's all I can say is that that we're standing here in the, the archives. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. The records that you have here. No, I'm not doing. But but no, it's just and a lot of them are going online now. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many. I mean, uh, so many books there. But, Um, that's that's an index of those 550 people that were executed. So I, over the years, I've been working on this a long time. Over the years, um, yes, I've, I've just each person found their records, um, what they did, why they were accused, the, the court records, um, uh, and that court records are all online these days from the archives, um, and uh, then just newspaper reports on trove. Um, and uh, various books, there have been lots of books about. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's just, yeah. And I got, got this, um, as I don't know what people know, but I used to uh, manage the, the penitentiary chapel historic site up there in Campbell Street, which the gallows are still there. Um, and um, when when I first took over, I got a, a call, I was talking to one of the warders at Prison, and he said, "Oh, do you know we've still got the uh, the gallows and the tractor and everything else stored here at Risden Prison?" So I went over to Risden Prison with my trailer and drove into the prison yards, and we carried out the beams and the trapdoor, and eventually we we re rebuilt them at, at Campbell Street. Um, and it, it was it was important that it should be there, uh, but then the hope. Hobart City Council, I hope that no representative here. Hobart City Council said, no, it's a, a place of execution, so you can't take tourists in here, but we ignored it. Um, <laughs> and it's still it's still there today. If you want to go for a, a trip, a tour through the penitentiary chapel, it's, it's still a operates, yes. And you can see the uh, the gallows and what happened here. But yes, certainly. material to share and there's a copy of uh, Brian's book which is about a, a convict. It does mention Solomon Blade and also importantly for us some of the records that um, Brian has referenced over time for his research. So I'll leave that there and say thank you very much oh, Brian for us and uh, what a great end to National Family History Month. Thank you.